Hey everybody, Stephen Cornett here, back with another Nature's Always Right video to go in depth with you on spring seed starting. We are gonna go through how to make a dry seeding mix that's the perfect ratio, whether you're doing soil blocks, plug trays, or six cells, and I'm gonna show you how to plant each one of those and give you some different technique tips for adding your soil or to the plug trays or creating your soil blocks. We'll go over when are the best planting dates for spring, I'll also be showing you some different amendments if you wanna boost the nutritional quality of your soil, showing you how to plant the actual seeds themselves, give you watering tips, uh, tips to help prevent dampening off and other possible issues so that you can have the most success when planting your seedlings this spring. So this will be a really detailed video for beginners and even people who have been gardening for quite some time. I'm gonna give you all my tips that I've been able to gather and experience over the last 10 years. So the next big question, when do I plant my seeds? What time of year? Now, all this is gonna depend on your first frost date and your last frost date. So just do a search online, first frost date in San Diego or wherever your city is, and it's gonna give you that. Mine is April 11th, and it's a good idea to become familiar with your zones. So um, San Diego was zone 10A, now in Tennessee I'm zone 7a and these just um, tell you what is you know the average lowest temperature so with that knowledge then that's when you can start planning out when you want to plant something so typically what i would recommend is you could start planting your first seeds four weeks before that first frost date and be in a good position now, if you don't have an indoor place to start seeds or some sort of small greenhouse, that may be difficult because depending on your zone, I'm in zone 7A, if you're in a higher zone where it gets colder more often at lower, much lower temperatures, you may plant, and if you plant it outside, you'll go down to 10 degrees and then it'll wipe out um, your lettuce, your tomatoes, anything that you planted. So keep that in mind. You may need to wait to start your seeds closer to that frost date in order for them to live if you're outside. You can also do it inside under some fluorescent lights. And that's what a lot of people in the um, higher latitudes will do. They start everything indoors in a warm area. Uh, so things like tomatoes that people will typically grow out even longer, you could start those like eight weeks because those you're potting up so that um, when the last frost date passes, you can put those into the ground safely at an already a huge size. It gives you a way bigger jump on the season. So um, the bigger you want your plants, so if you want bigger pepper plants right at the beginning, um, you need to start those seeds earlier and prepare for that. Um, that's typically something more that um, farmers are going to be doing, um, or if you're planting and then putting those into a heated greenhouse, you can start a lot sooner. But for most of us who are doing basic gardening, that isn't going to be necessary. But keep in mind that there are ways that you can start your season earlier with some proper planning. So the first thing that we need to do, whether we're doing plug trays, soil blocks, or pots, is to get a dry soil mix. Now the easiest thing to do is to go out and just buy what's called a propagation mix, like ProMix, um, which works fantastically, it's very easy, but very expensive. So I'm gonna show you how to make your own ProMix. Uh, it takes a little bit more work. You need a couple different ingredients, but the end result's fantastic, and you'll be able to make soil blocks or use it for your plug trays. Um, I even recommend making a lot large amount of this at a time, and you can just store it in a tub so that whenever you need to plant more seeds or make more soil blocks, you have that ready to go. And that's something I did for my market garden to make it more efficient and just make a lot at one time. So today I'm just gonna show you the ratio and the few secrets that it takes to make a good propagation mix at home. So for this mix, we'll need just three ingredients, high quality compost, peat moss or cocoa coir, perlite or pumice stone. Compost, of course, is adding nutrition, organic matter that the, the seeds will need once they sprout. The peat moss is uh, giving a lot more fluff, moisture retention, and helps the soil blocks to hold together or help the plug tray to hold together. Um, when you pop out your plug, it helps the soil to hold together and not blow apart when you're going to plant. And the perlite adds aeration um, and allows water to flow through the soil more easily. Uh, you could also use vermiculite, but vermiculite is more expensive, a lot more, like four times more the cost of perlite. The one benefit to vermiculite, which you may want, is it 
um, retains moisture better. It allows airflow, but can it's softer and, and holds the moisture better. I like that if you're gonna be planting stuff in summer and you're worried about the um, the soil drying out. Vermiculite can be a way to help buffer that. So now we just need a measuring cup. The five gallon bucket is the perfect measuring cup because three or four of these in a wheelbarrow maxes it out and allows you to mix it easily within a wheelbarrow. So my ratio is one bucket of compost, one bucket of perlite or cocoa, and a half bucket of perlite or vermiculite. This will make soil blocks or plug trays. I recommend one of the best things you can do as a gardener is finding a really good source of compost, especially animal-based compost. It's much more nutrient rich. Now, if you can't find that and your only choice is to go get some bagged soil, just get a high quality organic uh, bagged potting mix. So this right here is one of the secrets of making a good propagation mix. You need to strain all of your materials down to a quarter inch. This is just quarter inch hardware cloth on a very simple frame that I built. So here's my compost. This is some local mushroom compost. So now why am I using a mushroom compost and I, when I recommended an animal-based compost? Well, that's because in my area, it's difficult to find inexpensive animal-based compost. And many of the animals in my area, they're eating hay uh, or being fed things that I don't want them to eat, like hay that's sprayed with grazon or other herbicides, and I don't want that in my compost. Mushroom compost is a good way to get um, decent quality and also be pretty clean as well. So I paid $300 for 12 yards, cubic yards for this stuff. Now in San Diego, I could get um, one yard of really good, ready to go. I can plant right into it and it's incredible soil for $35 a yard. And that was uh, rabbit and cow manure. So it just depends where you are and what connections that you have, but finding the best quality for the best price is what you're looking for, of course. Now, if this compost wasn't so wet, this would be easier. And there's some pieces of clay in here, sort of material, or it's not fully composted carbon. My previous compost was much, a lot easier to sift back in San Diego. So the rest of this, I'll just throw back in my compost pile and it'll go into my garden beds. So now you can see the difference and how good this stuff looks for a propagation mix. Okay, now we're gonna do peat moss and the perlite. Perlite, you can buy in a less coarse version. If you have access to that, then buy the smaller grain. Uh, I wasn't able to find it at a cheaper price. So I need to strain this out. All these bigger chunks will can impede the germination of seeds and just kind of get in the way. So with these three ingredients plus water, that's everything that we need for our propagation mix but I'm gonna show you a few other things that I like to add because I like to ensure that all the vitamins and minerals are there for the plant from seed all the way to harvest. That way the plant can defend itself um, better from whatever is attacking it. Um, just like our bodies, if we have all the right nutrition, we can fight off illness as well. So I'm gonna be adding in azomite, kelp meal, and then I'm gonna mix a little bit of a fish hydrolysate. Fish hydrolysate's a fantastic organic fertilizer that you can use that has nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, um, some other micronutrients as well. But like I said, uh, you don't need to use those things. If you have a high quality compost, that's more than enough nutrition to grow good seedlings um, until they get out into your garden. I am just gonna put a very small amount, one tablespoon. And then I'll mix that with a couple gallons of water and then I'll throw it in. One quick tip, if you're gonna use this as a dry mix to save for later, then do not do what I just did and add water, keep it dry. I know I'm gonna use all this up right now to plant all my seeds. So uh, keep that in mind when you're doing this. If I'm not giving some extra fertilizer like this, then I actually like to keep it dry and, to, and mix it dry then put it into another tote that I would get wet uh, to create my soil blocks, or I'll leave it dry for just putting in the plug trays. This is not gonna be enough moisture where it's gonna mess any of that up, um, but those are just some other factors to, to keep in mind. I like to mix with a straight edge shovel or a pitchfork works great too, but the straight edge allows me to scrape the bottom 
um, and really get a good mix and not leave anything behind. So now we have our finished dry mix. Mine has a little bit of moisture because we added that fish fertilizer. The fish fertilizer is a great way if you don't think your compost has enough um, nutrients in it or something, it's a little bit weak, that's a great way to boost it. And I'm gonna put links in the description below to all the different products I'm using if you wanna check them out more. Okay, so now that we have our dry mix, now it's time to plant either soil blocks, which you'll need a soil blocker and a mesh tray, or a plug tray. Now, I would recommend, if you don't have any of this stuff, to get it all from bootstrapfarmer.com. I've got a link down in the description. All of their trays are super high quality, will last you a lifetime, unlike this flimsy thing here, which is cracking on me. Um, I'll put a link for the soil blocker as well. Now, what is the difference between the two? Well, I did um, some comparison videos in the past that I will link for you guys in the description if you wanna check out the, the differences and how things grew. But basically, soil blocks are my definite favorite. I like them because you can leave them in the blocks and the plant can grow a little bit bigger longer. So if you wanna have a little bit more fudge time um, for when your plants need to get into the ground, this is a great way. It's also very easy to plant these. There's no popping out things out of plugs. It's just grab and go. A little bit more work up front to create the soil mix, but well, well worth it in my opinion. The seedlings are a little bit healthier. Now, the plug trays, these are never sink trays. They're a little bit more expensive. I don't recommend these unless you're um, doing farming or making money doing this. So then, you know, it could justify the cost. These are a little bit um, higher quality. They have some features that are very nice about them. Uh, but for the plug tray, uh, when it's time to plant them, you have less time to wait before they need to get in the ground. There's an optimal amount of time when the plant reaches a, a certain size that it's, hey, I'm ready, you need to plant me within a couple days. This buys you an extra week or two weeks before you really need to get it in the ground to let it thrive. Okay, so for plug trays, it's super simple. You know, I like to fill it up in the wheelbarrow or if you have a higher workstation where you don't have to bend over, that's way more ideal but just for demonstration purposes. I'll just throw a bunch on top, run my hand across the top, pushing down just to push it in. So then, you know, just drop it once or twice. Typically the outer edge um, will lose soil. So come back and make sure that the outer edge is completely filled up with soil. Okay, so plug tray is ready. Simple as that, 50 cells ready to plant. So now soil blocks, I like to put a bunch of my mix in a tote like this because we need to get the soil a little bit wetter and it allows me to put it on a table and work very ergonomically. Now, cause it's already has decent moisture. I'm gonna add some more, but not as much as I normally would. It needs to be the right moisture so that when we create the block, it all sticks together really well. So I'll add, mix it around. Now the beauty of having some leftover dry mix is that if you get this too wet, you can add in more of your mix that's in the perfect ratio uh, to soak up some of that water and will make the soil blocks easier to work with. And the other reason to have that dry mix is that when you go to close off your holes at the end for your plants, you have something to top with. So I got this way too wet because I was talking to the camera. So I'm gonna add in some more mix as you do a couple rounds of soil blocks, you'll get better at knowing what the moisture is gonna be. But let me show you a couple techniques of how to test it. So one of my tests, I just kinda get it flat and it's the jiggle test. This is still a little bit too wet and I can see the moisture coming up on the top there. This is a little too wet, but it's still workable. My, I know that my ratio is perfect because as I throw it on, the, on my hand here, it doesn't completely deform. It also doesn't explode into a million pieces. So this is a two inch soil blocker. I recommend using this size for everything. You can even grow tomatoes, any, any big seedlings in these and plant these straight into the ground. You don't have to pot them up. That's something I like about this size. You can pot up if you wanna get them bigger though. So as I'm pushing down, I'm doing this rocking motion or you can rock side to side and that will pre prevent suction from pulling the blocks back out of the soil blocker. So this is still a little bit too wet, but if, if you are missing some areas, what you can do is just slide that across 
and that'll get the, the blocks as thick as possible. So down in the bottom here, there's a bunch of moisture built up. That's also an indicator that there is a bit too much moisture in my mix. I think that's the hardest thing to get right is the amount of moisture. But if you have more dry mix, it's okay. You just add more. Okay, and that's it. And then I just squeeze and my blocks are ready and it pokes a hole so they're ready to plant already. Now, if I'm going and I see that some of the blocks are taller or shorter than others, what that means is when I'm punching in, when I'm putting the soil into the blocks, not enough soil is going inside of the blocker. And that's what you're doing wrong. So they should be a pretty consistent height. And if you're having issues, do that this technique I showed you where you just push the mud in. Okay guys, so we're almost ready to plant. Soil blocks are ready to go. They've already got their holes punched, but we still need to punch some holes in our plug trays. So what I'm gonna do is just punch down a quarter to half inch deep hole. Most of your seeds will sprout great at just half an inch. Um, there are some weird seeds that uh, are much so small that you would just put the seeds on top and then just cover with dirt. You wouldn't even need to make a hole. So things like that, um, I don't know, like alyssum seed or, and I'm just gonna take one big strip of duct tape on here and take my Sharpie and label out what I wanna plant. You could also buy little sticks. You could use popsicle sticks. People cut up yogurt trays, all sorts of things. This is a real easy way too. just use a strip of duct tape. Now, well, before I plant my seeds, I'm gonna make sure that my hands are dry, they're not wet, and I get the soil off of them so that when I pour the seeds into my hands, they don't stick. Okay guys, so what I like to do is pour out the seeds into my hand. These are yarrow, they're a flower seed. And I put them in one hand, take them over, pinch, and then I just slowly rub my hands back, my fingers back and forth. To drop the seeds. Now yarrow is a good example of one of those very small seeds that um, you barely need to cover with soil at the end. And for most of your seeds, you're, you're just trying to drop two or three seeds. And on some of your seed packets, it's going to tell you the germination rate percentage. Some won't. They'll, they'll give you important information about the plant. On this tomato, it tells you it's an 88%. Okay, so if you plant two seeds, you're guaranteed essentially to have one sprout. So now if it's a really low percentage, like 70, I might do three seeds. But just keep in mind that if you do too many, you're gonna have to come back and thin them out later on. Because if you have too many plants growing in the same spot, they're all gonna be competing for light and it's just not gonna work out very well. So the final step is just gonna be to cover up with our seeds. There is something that can happen called dampening off. And that's a fungus that you'll see like a green layer on the top of your um, plug trays or your soil blocks. Now, that uh, can be prevented by top covering this with um, some fine perlite or vermiculite. And that will allow for some airflow to come on the top and that will prevent that from happening. So there's a tip for that. I typically, I just cover it with my mix and things that just work out pretty well usually. So we'll see what it's like in this environment, but so now I'm just covering it enough to cover the seeds. I'm not trying to have a huge pile of soil on the top. Um, I like to control the depth that my seeds are at by pushing the seeds down or making a bigger hole for them. Um, you can make, now if you make some mistakes and you don't plant them deep enough, you can kind of make up for that by putting more soil on top um, or pressing the seed down in deeper like I did with the squash seeds. Now, when we water them in, we're gonna wanna get a light stream. We don't wanna be blasting the top of the soil off and then lightly water. So now the seeds are just gonna sit here and I'm gonna come back at least twice a day to check on them to make sure that the soil on top is staying completely wet. The thing that is gonna mess up your germination is if the seeds dry out. Once they start to pop, crack, and start to germinate, if they dry out, they will die. That's their most critical stage. So check at least two times a day, morning and the evening. I'd say even one more time in the afternoon. Come spritz them and you'll be good to go. So that is the number one mistake I see people doing is letting the seed dry out. Once the seed is germinated and if you're seeing it grow, that soil still needs to maintain its moisture. Um, until the plant gets planted into the ground, essentially, 
that should always have moisture in it. You should never let it dry out. So there's a great example of, you can see some of the trays have dryness on top and then some look wet. Now, if you were to dig down a little bit, you would notice that it is still wet under there, but that's your indicator that they need more moisture. So I'm using one of these really cheap greenhouses. You can get them on Amazon or anywhere. I had a friend who wasn't using it, so he gave it to me, but these are great just for starting things out. And if you want a little boost, you can see I planted these three or four days ago and things are already starting to sprout here. So that's all it takes. And you know, within seven days of you planting and there's, you know, 60, 70, 80 degree temperatures, things will start to sprout for you and things will be good. If it's going seven days or longer and you're not seeing stuff starting to pop, that may be a time to start worrying. But what I recommend that you do leading up to spring and summer planting is to plant each week, plant extras, backups. There may be bugs that come and eat your stuff, rabbits, um, something, you know, weather may come, they may die. You may actually get a, one more extra frost past your frost date. There's lots of different things that can go wrong. So if you plant, you know, a succession of each of these plants, you're gonna guarantee yourself something um, in the ground come spring and summer and successful plants. And then you also wanna keep in mind some of these things that you've planted, like tomatoes, peppers, they're gonna produce for the summer, squash for the summer. Um, a lot of people will plant a second round, plan for that planted in maybe May or June of like squat, your summer squashes or even uh, tomatoes to try and get another second harvest. Um, but things like your lettuces, spinach, green onions, things like that, you wanna think about planting, you know, maybe once a month for just a regular homeowner or homesteader person. So that way you'll have a continual harvest of all those different things. If you're doing direct seeding, which I'll be doing in soil beds out there of your root crops like carrots, beets, radishes, uh, turnips, all those different things, um, you wanna get on a schedule of planting those so you can have a continual harvest. You know, it depends, I don't know how much you're eating or if you're selling it, but you know, Every week to four weeks, you're planting something, um, the same things over and over again. So those are my last couple tips for you. Just know that this is not easy. This is one of the most important and also difficult skills of growing your own food is planting seeds, um, figuring out the timing of plantings, dealing with the seasons, and all of that stuff. So don't get, beat yourself up about it. Don't get discouraged, just keep trying. And that's why I recommended like plant like once a week for four weeks leading up to this spring time to your frost date so that you'll have a guaranteed um, set of plants that you can put out there and that will survive. So I've put down in the description uh, the places that I recommend getting seeds, True Leaf Market, uh, Bootstrap Farmer for your trays, all the different tools and different things that you might need. And that's just a great place that you can go and support my channel, um, buying something that you already needed and I get a small little kickback from that and it's at no cost to you.